Now, this next segment is brought to you by the AERA, the Automotive Engine Rebuilders Association, and Chuck Lynch will be joining me on screen. We're not going to see Chuck initially, but he's going to go through his presentation. We will hear Chuck, of course, uh, and then hopefully you guys will have some questions. We'll hit Chuck with the questions. We're going to continue on with our broadcast. Chuck, do you read me? I got you. Good to hear you, my friend. I am pretty excited. Uh, as much as as much as we would love to see your face, we're probably a little more interested in the presentation today from AERA. First of all, thank you for joining us on the Engine Performance Expo. Thank you for having me. So dive in. Take us through. All right, let's get going. So. Today we're going to discuss surface finish. The, the discussion will be of surface roughness, surface flatness, and waviness. So these are all paramount to uh, gasket sealability, um, and more so today where we're actually moving away from so many of the th you know thick gaskets, rubber gaskets, things of that nature that we've been uh, used to in the past, cork and so forth. So surface roughness, I thought this was a, a fitting image, uh, you know, at, at the uh, huge level, we always talk peaks and valleys, and it's something we can relate to, you know, when in the topography around us. So again, surface roughness is the measure of deviation of a surface. Uh, the measurable factor um, of roughness is peak to valley height. Uh, so surface roughness can and will pay impact the interrelationship of components and therefore must have controls. In some applications, too smooth can be just as problematic as too rough. Uh, this holds true for gaskets and seals. Uh, just a little step away there. Actually, oftentimes when people are polishing crankshafts, they uh, are unaware that you actually want a rougher surface finish for your seal surface, typically like 10 to 20 RA than you would on your journal surface, which you would um, ideally like to see at less than 10 RA or like 60 RZ. Um, so, so moving on, how is roughness measured? Well, in the contact method, which most of us are going to measure with, uh, especially in the production environment, roughness is measured with a skidded profilometer. That means that the drive unit and the stylus, uh, typically fitted with a diamond that contacts the surface to be analyzed is actually on the part. Uh, so the, the feedback mechanism, and, and we all talk about like the SJ201 uh, or the 210, um, Lake and the team, they, they, they move a lot of that particular product. That's a skidded instrument that actually lays right on the, the part that you're measuring in the cylinder. The drive mechanism and the stylus are in contact. So as that thing pulls back, that little diamond is measuring up and down. So here's a big exploded view of, of what you're actually uh, working with. As the stylus uh, sends that feedback, uh, much like, you know, this is very much like a uh, old vinyl record. So that up and down amplitude modulation uh, is the feedback that you're giving and that's how you're recording the uh, the surface finish. Now, non-contact is something that has it's it's gaining popularity, but we're still at the point where it's not typically used in the traditional machine shop atmosphere. It it has its place in more in the lab environment. So. As you can see from this, this is definitely um, a generated uh, image. Laser scanning microscopes are very expensive and uh, require higher level technicians to even evaluate the, the results. Uh, vision systems are becoming more affordable um, and they are, again, they're making their way into the R&D labs, just not so much in the you know day-to-day -day rough and tumble uh, chip making environment. Now, I, I actually uh, took a picture of this. I have one of these, it's pretty old. I remember Federal Mogul or Felpro actually used to share these. Uh, some of the sales guys had these, but a surface roughness comparator. I'm sure a lot of you guys have these laying around in the shop. Although it's not a, 
a way that you can put a good quantitative number to the to the parts, you you can get a good comparison. So in this, you'll see there's some lapped finishes, uh, honed finishes, uh, broached finishes. Uh, show some indication of of back cutting uh, and what impact that may or may not have on on roughness. But anyway, um, I just thought I would share that. Again, uh, it used to be a pretty common thing in the world of surface finishing. So roughness parameters. Um, this is this is a tough one. Uh, we're going to stick with just a couple RA and RC when we're talking about gasket surface finishes. As everyone knows, especially from talking cylinder board finishes, there are tons and tons of parameters out there. But uh, again, we're going to stick with the, the with the common ones that are used for gasket surface finishing, and I'll share why. Uh, like on cylinder bores, why I think RZ is a much better uh, parameter to use instead of RA. So RA is uh, roughness average. Um, the mean roughness average is uh, the arithmetic average of absolute values of roughness profile. RA again, the most commonly used. Um, the next slide will, will indicate kind of why it's a problem. Uh, so some of the, the challenges with RA, uh, you see the top image and the bottom, bottom image here, they both have the same roughness average. But if you take a look at that top image, uh, for sure on a bearing surface, you wouldn't want that. But the, likewise, you wouldn't want that on a gasket either. Uh, you know, those particular areas that are sticking up, those little ferrites, um, can be scrubbed off pretty easily. So it impacts uh, clamp force, uh, your ability to maintain load, and uh, also that is going to hold the, the gasket ceiling areas up higher, especially on like MLS gaskets that are much harder and don't conform as well as the old composite gaskets, paper clay, graphite. Um, so it can result in cold sealability issues. So roughness, surface roughness, RZ is the average of the five uh, highest peaks and uh, five lowest valleys in the sample evaluation length. Um, now, actually, Mark Malberg does a video on this and that uh, I recently shared, and he's got some tremendous stuff online if you guys ever want to check um, his stuff out. But this speaks to, like the JIS standard, they're looking at the high, five highest peaks and the five lowest valleys in each sample length. So anytime you're using your profilometer, you may get like five sampling lengths. So it'll that measurement will be times five. So it, it does give a good description of the overall surface finish. Um, so th again, there's more information on that out there, but this is definitely a, a good parameter to look at, uh, again, on bearing journal surfaces. Um, there's a lot to be you know, shared about. Like on a, an aggressive RA is, uh, is an RZ, that is at least six times higher than the RA for like journal surfaces. But, you know, there's all these types of rules that can match kind of the application. But again, it's, it's about data, uh, as we talked about earlier. Um, you, it's nice to know the old methodologies of how to, to do a partic particular practice, but modern technology has given us the opportunity to record and better evaluate. So we're looking for repeatability and re reproducibility you know, in the gauging world, R&R, &R, um, by being able to break that data down further, like using RZ, it'll tell you more about your end product. So <clears throat> why does this matter? So surface roughness can have an impact on the ability of the gasket to, to perform in the short term and over the long term. So aggressive surfaces can shear gasket materials. Um, I'm sure that anybody that was building engines in, in that transitional years, the 80s and the 90s, aluminum blocks, cast iron, or cast iron uh, blocks, aluminum heads, well, what kind of surface finish to use? 
the aluminum expansion contracts at 11 times the rate of the iron. So then you started to see more false Brunelling in the gaskets because the, the aluminum head was scuffing. So you had to change the finish to allow it to slip a little bit. Um, so you have to keep that in mind. Uh, aggressive surfaces wear down more quickly. Uh, like if you have a rough cylinder bore and the rings knock that stuff down. Uh, again, same thing happens with, with gaskets. Those peaks are the first things to get scrubbed off. Uh, this is observed as false brunelling uh, or fretting and can ultimately allow the, the flange or the armor to move around and you have a blown head gasket. Uh, aggressive surface finishes have a issue, can cause issues with cold sealability. Um, gaskets are always going to have some kind of cold seal material applied. It varies greatly between the aftermarket and the OE. The OE typically has a less sticky material because you know they're figuring on a more sanitary environment, and the gaskets aren't packaged and shipped and stored in warehouses and moved around. They go more from manufacturing and bulk dunnage and get to the engine builder much quicker. So there is definitely a difference between an OE and an aftermarket gasket when it comes to cold seal. Uh, surfaces that are too smooth for conventional composite gaskets can allow the gasket to, to flow or move around, which can also show up as like burnishing or burnelling and lead to gasket failure. This image, uh, again, I borrowed from uh, Mark at Digital Metrology because I thought it was such a, a good image. He's talking about the different filters and what you can see with the, the technology to measure surface finish. But for us that are using three, like the 3H round uh, in CBN inserts in for instance, a fly cutter, a fly bar, uh, you will leave a surface finish that looks very much like this. So the shape of that radius is left behind. So you see the little gray fuzzy lines are more of the surface roughness. And then the overall pattern that's created by the machining is indicated in red there. So I kind of drew, okay, if we were to try to press the gasket into that surface, you still have these leak paths under there. So again, that's why uh, we need to know where we're at with surface finish. Uh, surface flatness, and again, in, in our world, for the most part, typically flatness is measured um, as a qualification process for any gasket replacement or repair. The common method of flatness is uh, with a certified straight edge and feeler gauges. Although it's a tried and true method, um, it's still done every day all across the world um, to qualify, do I need to resurface this head or not? Um, it still is not an indication of waviness. The, the feeler gauge and the width of it is going to be much greater in dimension than what you can uh, actually determine in waviness and how that can impact the gasket. So again, as like in the previous slide, uh, roughness profile and waviness profile are totally different. Um, waviness is typically induced by our processes, the equipment, and I'll get to that. So here, indication of waviness spacing, kind of the lay direction. So anytime we have a fly cutter in a spindle, we have a single point tool, uh, we get kind of that radius direction. Um, and then again, we're always concerned about roughness height. Uh, measuring waviness. Uh, when measuring waviness, I, earlier I was speaking about the, the skidded instrument. Uh, when we get into measuring waviness, we'll talk about a skidless device. So as you can see, the actual the stylus and the drive mechanism is on mounted on like a height gauge, and the drive mechanism will not set on the part that you're measuring. So you put the part that you want to measure underneath and the stylus usually looks quite a bit different as well, uh, just so that there won't be any contact with any of the drive mechanism. And then it will go, it will take a trace and 
it'll be able to exclude anything that is induced by just the surface or the part that you're measuring. That way you then you can use some filters to determine, uh, okay, the difference between my roughness and the waviness. So what does waviness uh, do to the gasket? So more rigid designs like MLS gaskets, uh, going back to that earlier image that I shared, uh, they don't conform to waviness as well as like a, a paper clay composite gasket, uh, graphite, uh, which is, again, they're reasonably soft materials, so they conform very well. The, the embossments in the steel, the steel stopper layer, that makes the gasket pretty stiff. Now, I know when I first started looking at blown head gaskets or failed gaskets, people would complain of you know compression and cooling system, things of that nature. And you look at a MLS gasket, well, I don't see it. I don't see the telltale signs of you know, armor nose deformation, the uh, graphite blown out, the rusty trails migrating across the paper. You don't see some of those things with the MLS gaskets and it, it makes you scratch your head. Well, what was really going on? I don't, that's oftentimes if you take the layers and you start to pull the, the multiple layers apart of the MLS gasket, and then it looks like tiger stripes inside. So carbon's been tracking between the layers. You know, oh, okay. So what is, what's given me those tiger stripes? Well, and then you start to do uh, you know, Fuji paper testing, get the ability to measure uh, waviness and whatnot. And then you find out that, okay, so it's, it's waviness that's causing the problem. It's still a leak path. So, um, you know, just some of my experiences over time. Um, so if the wave distances are pretty wide, then the gas is gonna be more likely to conform to it. But if the wave height so you've got a WT of 125, but that happens in a in a trace length of 150 thousandths. You, you're probably going to have a hard time getting the gasket to conform to that. So you may still have a, a leak. And it's not to scare you off and say, "Well, what's a profilometer going to, you know, tell me now?" Um, some of these kind of things you can actually see. Um, you know, if you if the light hits a, a part right, and you can see it looks like a, a rainbow um, sometimes that's kind of a, a waviness thing so um, so just you know we listen you know it was mentioned earlier talking about the sounds and how we go some of the seat of the pants stuff and stuff a lot of that stuff is still relevant uh, you know like if an insert's getting dull and and it goes from a nice crisp sound when it hits the part to more of a thump or thug you know, then and you know, hey, something's out of whack. So, uh, but I'm gonna share some things about how you can stop waviness from existing because oftentimes it's something that is in our control. Once the, if the equipment and everything's right, waviness is not proven to be much of an, uh, an issue. Um, again, if, if we keep the things in our control, in control. So again, back to that same image uh, that I, I really like this again it's a good indication of what the gasket's seeing against the surface finish so there are parameters and guidelines available to the aftermarket i've attached some uh it's actually a, a bulletin from velpro but basically everybody agrees with the surface uh standards so mala comedic and so on uh Elring Clinger, uh, when it, when we talk about these roughness parameters, they are well accepted in the in the industry when it comes to surface finish. So flatness and surface finish, um, maximum amount of flat uh, across the length of like a V6 head gasket would be three thousandths from intake to exhaust two thousandths. That's a that's a pretty standard dimension that you can use um, if anybody wants this information. Again, you can get reach out to Felpro or you can reach out to the AERA tech line and we'd be more than happy to share this, uh, this bulletin. It's, it's very helpful. <clears throat> so here's where we get into the roughness parameters, uh, RA and RZ. So conventional, you know, cast iron heads and blocks, conventional type gasket, uh, 150 RZ, 
uh, recommended range four to 800 RZ or, you know, 60 to 100 RA. Again, 100, that's gonna be your max limit. Most people, they always talk about that 60 RA number. Uh, and where I, <clears throat> when I worked in the production engine rebuild world, uh, we basically set parameters for like your composite gaskets, a 100 to 300 RZ and uh, like the MLS, um, you know, like a max of uh, one, 150 and uh, shoot for lower numbers on those. Uh, aluminum heads again, because of uh, the expansion contraction rates being higher, again, the numbers show to be lower there. So you want those with the lower surface finish. Intake and exhaust manifolds, so many of those are a steel gasket. So you kind of treat them like they're an MLS and uh, run with those lower numbers. So again, it's so a maximum of 60 RA, but I would target at 150. <clears throat> so um, waviness, you see they actually even share some dimensionals on waviness height, so. So and no, no sudden irregularities of more than a foul. So a chipped insert, or if you have a back cut or something of that nature, uh, like if you got a machine, maybe you got a bearing issue, and sometimes at the end of the cycle, that they seem to run okay, and then at the very end of the cycle, you got one scratch that's through the part, uh, or get like some cutter head drop or something of that nature. So again, look for those, those types of irregularities. Um, something on a workbench that causes a scratch or whatever. Ah, it's just one scratch, is that gonna matter? Well, probably really matters where it's at more than anything. But. So what types of gaskets is uh, this pertinent information for? Pretty much any and all gaskets, you need clean, dry, flat surfaces. Uh, with the rubber gaskets, yeah, you can get, you can get too smooth uh, where they can contend to want to flow or be pushed out. Um, and they can also be so rough that they, that they shred gaskets. Um, in modern engines, you have to think about the depth of the groove, like a 6064 Navistar. I know a lot of people have to align bore that diesel engine block for oversized bearings. And then they'll talk about, you know, milling the bottom, milling the bottom of the block for that bed plate and how much can you go before it does damage to the gasket. So things like that you gotta think of, but you also have to uh, make sure that you make the surface accepting to seal oil from migrating uh, from inside the block to the outside. So variables, uh, we always have them. Again, I know we're primarily talking to the high performance market. Um, but I know there's also shops that are that are doing you know stock production stuff that are uh, taking the opportunity to learn some things today. So the use of shims for thin head castings, um, it's been around a long time, but it still is practiced. So surface finish should be equal to MLS for the shim side and accurate to the gasket requirement on the other side. So if you're going to put that steel against the block, make it as smooth as possible. And then you would apply a, a sealant like a high tack, it's an aerosol or they got a brush on type material. It's kind of like a flange gasket elim eliminator. It doesn't create that shimming effect that, that lifts parts up like silicone would. So um, anyway, it would be more similar like they would apply at a gasket manufacturing facility. And <clears throat> using an aftermarket composite gasket um, in place of an M MLS gasket. It happens uh, in some instances, there's been a ton of research done and, and they find the materials that, that work well. Um, you just need to really reach out to your gasket supplier and say, okay, what kind of surface finish requirements are you looking for? Do you apply additional uh, sealing materials or anything of that nature? Um, so just keep that in mind. Uh, machine factors that can influence roughness and waviness. Um, this also means these are in your control. Uh, so one of the first and easiest things to 
to check is speed and feed. Um, that definitely controls your, your roughness, but it, if you make a tool work too hard, um, then you can induce waviness. Uh, you start having lift and drop over cylinder bores, um, big water holes and whatnot, just because you're pushing your equipment really hard and then you can have in issues there. Insert ed prep and condition. Um, insert material choice, I tooling suited for iron but not aluminum. I know these, I see this topic pop up in some of those uh, forums on online all the time. Uh, PCD works terrific for aluminum. <clears throat> It'll fail quickly if you run it on iron. CBN works for both iron and aluminum, but can build up and smear uh, on if you're using aluminum. I know people will use things like you know, glass cleaner, pledge, oils, things of that nature. Uh, again, probably work with your tool supplier. Uh, if you don't keep the stuff there in a mist, oftentimes just the, the windage that's created by the fly cutter kind of blows the stuff away anyway. So how much uh, are you gaining by doing something like that? If you don't have flooded cooling uh, during the machining process, then you know, you've got to really uh, take a good close evaluation. Hey, and what I am doing, is that really helping me? Uh, buy metal. Here's where, you know, you should really run a different insert if you're doing bi metal castings and stay away from an edge prep. You want that thing as sharp as possible, dead sharp. Some of the verbiage or uh, terminology that would be used for the uh, tool guy would be an up sharp insert, dead sharp insert, no home, no land. Polish the face of it if, it's, if possible. That way you don't have stuff trying to stick to it. And yes, insert life will be sacrificed because, you know, like your kitchen knife, the sharper you have it, the quicker it gets dull. You have that with, uh, with these inserts as well. They do a terrific job if they're really sharp and polished and stuff doesn't want to stick to it. Uh, but you also lose that edge a bit more quickly. So um, just keep that in mind. Machine setup to include level. Um, I'm sure Ed could attest to this and many other Rottler folks. Oftentimes, uh, you'll get complaints about bad surface finish and it's because you have what we'll like to refer to as like a soft foot because, you know, traffic past the machine, whether it's a pallet jack with heads or castings or forklift or whatever, and you can upset the machine and you have a soft foot. So then you have a vibration and that's induced into everything and and then I got something funky looking surface finish, chatter, things of that nature. So that's that's a really easy thing to uh, to check out before you get into the deep, hard, difficult uh, types of situations. Uh, you know, the condi condition of your uh, x-axis, uh, gibs, ways, uh, drive motor conditions, uh, lead screws, bearings. Again, you know, a well-maintained machine uh, well, you know, inputs and outputs. If you uh, if you don't have a good piece of equipment, you're probably not going to make really good surface finishes. But you have to maintain it. And typically, uh, you know, I just recently, Steve and I at the AERA did a a podcast on um, our out. We have the Engine Professional podcast, and we actually were just talking about this as well. But uh, you know, maintaining the equipment because it doesn't just go bad overnight typically. Now, of course, there's crashes and things of that nature um, where it can happen abruptly, but typically we, we lose control a little bit at a time. So just keep that in mind, have maintenance schedules and uh, stay on top of your equipment because you know, lack of maintenance could lead to blown head gaskets. Uh, machine spindle conditions, again, bearings, uh, the ability to maintain a Z height Things like uh, tilt, uh, backlash, you know, is the machine belt driven, gear driven? Belt driven machines don't usually induce too many crazy things into uh, a surface finish, but a gear driven machine, if you've got excessive lash or something, uh, when you when that insert's coming around, it crashes into the cylinder head and then the, the pressure is released as it leaves the other side of the part, 
Okay. So you can have a you know an oscillation effect and that can impact surface finish. And typically that's the kind of stuff that will be like chatter or waviness. Now surface roughness probably won't change much, but when we talk about is it truly flat without waviness, then it may exist. Uh, machine modifications, sometimes adding additional cutters, bigger diameter cutters, different rake angles, so forth. You know, machines have horsepower ratings. Uh, honing machines are a good example of, you know, when you take a five horsepower machine and you look at some of the modern machines and, you know, they've gone to, I got a stroker motor, I got a spin motor, uh, horsepowers have changed and then you throw, go and throw diamonds in there, then, hey, you may, then you start to see something else wear out, uh, you know, the, the little planetary gear shearing off all the time. So just know that when you make these modifications, um, there may be some change downstream. So I go with a bigger insert so I can get stuff done quicker, or more inserts, and then all of a sudden I have a uh, surface finish is compromised. So keep that in mind. Uh, material of casting mean, uh, re being serviced, aluminum, iron, bimetal castings, uh, spray weld, like the high velocity spray arc stuff to save blocks, uh, any special coatings, uh, more recently, we talk often about compacted graphite, ductile. Uh, nearly all the diesel stuff is compacted graphite. The 2.7 Ford EcoBoost uh, is a very small engine, but a compacted graphite block. So again, back to my earlier um, conversation, the Upsharp CBN works well for bimetal blocks, uh, but in sort of life is reduced. Uh, Environment, is the floor adequate to support the equipment? Uh, vehicle travel near the machines, uh, dirt, you know, keep the equipment clean. Uh, fly cutter head, once you start to build up too much material in there, you know, they spend time and effort to get these fly cutter bodies balanced. And if you don't keep that clean and it picks up a lot of material in there, then I could have an out of balance in a fly cutter um, that is induced into the surface finish. Uh, crash tooling, you know, the, the tool holder has a particular shape, but if you can still use it after it's had a couple of hard crashes, what has that done for your balance? Um, electric repair motors are good options for getting the fly cutters and milling heads balanced and spindles for that matter. And uh, <clears throat> another thing that you can do um, in your shop is pressure sensing films um, that can help with a uh, determining how truly flat your surface finishes are. Uh, Fuji impression paper is probably the most common material now. Uh, back in the day, Dana uh, had in every Napa store across the country, you could buy carbonless impression paper and sheets, put that between your block and head and you could see what your surface finishes look like. Or you could actually, like here, you could put it on each side of the gasket and you could see where the gasket was actually applying or having the most load applied to the gasket itself. So um, just some good information on, on those type of materials that work very well. You can see a lot of this stuff with just the film, but there's actually equipment that will measure, uh, you know, hey, where it's the really dark pink, it's got this amount of a pressure applied, where it's really light pink, that's gonna, be say it's 3,000 pounds of clamping force, but in those areas where it's really high, uh, it's 15,000 pounds of clamping force. You know, most most head gaskets uh, or head bolts that we see in modern engines uh, are in that 12 to 15,000 pounds of clamping force for a, a, the 11 millimeter bolt. You go into the diesel world and easily twice that. So um, just sometimes underappreciated by what's going on there, you know, how much clamp force is being applied. So you need to make sure that uh, your surfaces are good to help support that and make sure that uh, we can seal combustion because it's even, you know, Randy Neal has said this in his presentation, you talk about uh, all modern engines are pretty much high performance engines. The EcoBoost, the late, LS's direct injected, everything's got some kind of air stuffer now. And so uh, 
high performance is everywhere, so you need to do everything you possibly can to give it a chance to live. <clears throat> so I mentioned the earlier, um, Mark Malberg is terrific for sharing information. And if you would uh, want to follow up on some more today, you know, we talked about roughness and waviness. Um, and he's got his notepad series, but he speaks to a lot of other surface finish parameters and has equipment for measuring surface more in like the lab type environment and the shop environment. Uh, so, you know, I definitely check him out. He's always a good steward to our industry, even though he doesn't necessarily work super heavily in this industry. And hey, Chuck. So, uh, yes. Let me jump in real quick and just give like a five minute warning for everybody out there to start thinking about their questions that they may have for you. Uh, as I know you are starting to get to the conclusion, we've got a couple of questions uh, coming in already, but I just want everybody to know. All right, back to you. 10-4. Actually, uh, yeah, we're getting getting to the end here just to uh, say some thanks um, for some folks that help get some information together and always supportive. Um, thanks for the opportunity to be a part of the Engine Performance Expo. And um, I know a, a lot of folks are members of the Engine Rebuilder Association already, and we appreciate that. And <clears throat> it's great to be a part of these things. Well, it's been so, a learning experience, certainly. and. Uh, we appreciate it. Now, I want everybody out there to know that we would love to have Chuck on the screen. This is the internet and the computer world you were just describing, Chuck. And so we do have a minor technical issue. We're not going to be able to see you during our question and answer session. But you are there. Chuck is there. And we can definitely hear you. And so uh, are, you, are you ready for some questions? He is. He's ready. All right, uh, first up, question for Chuck, and please send them in out there on the chat box. We appreciate it. Can you apply sealants to MLS gaskets? <clears throat> I know that it happens, but ideally, every gasket manufacturer is gonna say, don't do that. You don't know what that solvent is going to do to the materials that we already have applied. Are they gonna fight one another? They can get kind of a slippery, uh, surface and want to move around and then you can also it's more opportunity to pick up even like cardboard dust or anything that you might get between the gasket and the surface can then burn out blow out and cause a gasket failure um, so the gasket suppliers are by and large going to say don't do that please so okay uh, Ronnie out there a little bit earlier. Thank you, Ronnie, for that. Uh, old school copper coat. Would that be a plus or a minus on aluminum blocks? <clears throat> Again, I think I kind of answered that with that with that same, question there. Same deal. Uh, you know, the copper coat. If you're if you're using copper gaskets, and again, talk to your gasket manufacturer, um, and let them be the the be all end all when it comes to coatings. There you go. All right. Do iron and aluminum heads uh, on blocks get the or get the same surface finish? So iron or aluminum heads or blocks, do they get the same surface finish? Yeah, the gasket will dictate that. So um, MLS, it, it's very common. You know, you make that surface finish for MLS gaskets. Um, as I had mentioned in like that Felpro document, if you're going to run an aluminum head with a composite gas, it's got paper, clay, graphite, something of that nature, and I got an iron block, I would still run the aluminum on the lower end of the surface spec so that it can move a little bit. You don't want it too slick, but still keep it within that parameter, okay, of 60 to 90 or 30 to 60, just look at that chart, say, okay, I'm gonna keep on the low end of the spec for the aluminum egg, and I'll run the block a little bit higher to give it more of a grip, keep that gasket in place. Excellent, excellent. Uh, next one from Richard, and, and everybody out there is doing such a great job, like telling each other where they're watching from. We have people from all around the world. Uh, Richard asks about reusing an MLS head gasket, reusing gaskets, what do you say? <clears throat> You don't like it. I can I, tell already. I don't like it. I would, <laughs> I would probably, for torque plates only, 
um, you know, nothing ever locates exactly the same place again. And then the opportunity to pick up stuff, uh, you know, maybe if, if you're, it's a very controlled environment and you do it on a dyno run or something of that nature, but as a rule, no. Okay. Uh, Kenny out there, with the constant increase in clamping forces on gaskets, do you see any sort of potential for there to be too much clamping force and ruining a, a finish, making it like a, uh, a single-use deal? I, th I think you're actually seeing some of that where, like in aluminum castings, it doesn't take very long and you see the burnelling, um, you see the wetness marks into the castings. The gasket wants everything you can get. I've worked with the uh, engineers over the years, the gasket manufacturers, and they said that gasket wants all the force you can give it. But usually your block doesn't have the integrity to handle the fastener. You pull the block apart, you'll sink into the gasket surface. So yeah, we're already kind of there. And then with cylinder pressures, you have that constant. You're trying to blow the head off. You have a, a springy bolt, torque yield bolts, trying to pull it back together. And the embossments in the gaskets are very strong. So you are seeing that already. Excellent, excellent. Chuck, we really appreciate what you've done. The AERA, this has been a very interesting presentation. Obviously, gasket seal is super important with services. Uh, learned a lot. Really appreciate you participating with the Engine Performance Expo and sharing your knowledge with us. Well, thank you very much. Once again, you know, it's been a, been a privilege to be a part of this. Oh, it has been a privilege to have you on. We're all thrilled to do it, and uh, I know this is going to get shared all around the Internet. So thank you very much, Chuck. All Thank you. All right.